Hi. I would like to tell you something about the new diagnosis of complex PTSD as it is now released in the ICD-11 of the World Health Organization. This new diagnosis had been a result of our work uh, at a working group at WHO, which was global, multilingual, and with the participation of various professions in our field. I'd like to begin with some history and tell you that in ICD-10, there was next to the known PTSD diagnosis already a diagnosis which was called Enduring Personality Change After Catastrophic Experiences. This second diagnosis was somewhere hidden in later chapters of the ICD-10. But now the two conditions, PTSD and newly named and newly conceptualized complex PTSD had been brought together in one broader category in ICD-11. The predecessor diagnosis in ICD-10 of enduring personality change after catastrophic experiences had been defined as a personality change uh, after two, at least two years following exposure to catastrophic stress. And this disorder had been defined by several features, for example, hostile or distrustful attitude towards the world, social withdrawal, feelings of emptiness or hopelessness, a chronic feeling on being on edge, and estrangement. But it didn't include as symptoms the symptoms we now often call classic PTSD or core PTSD symptoms, namely intrusions, avoidance, and hypervigilance. And the ICD-10 also gave some examples when these other less known diagnoses um, had been de had developed, for example, after concentration camp experiences, after disasters, after prolonged captivity, torture, or being a victim of terrorism. When the expert group at WHO worked on the review and developing um, the diagnosis definitions, we had a prepared material by other parts of the WHO who had conducted a survey with clinicians around the world to assess their needs and their wishes, for example, for missing diagnosis. And the number one uh, of these list of missing diagnoses in practitioners around the world was what we now would call, will call, complex PTSD. And I'd like to um, cite a participant of this service who wrote, I feel a need to better account for consequences of complex trauma and the variety of processes which can be seen in such conditions. This was one of the very various reasons to include complex PTSD in ICD-11. Somewhat more history, I should tell you that the label of complex PTSD or complex trauma had been around for somewhat longer time. Already in 1992, Judith Lewis Herman coined the term and her colleague, together with the group, Bessel van der Kolk, in 1997, um, suggested a model or a concept of complex PTSD that consisted of several of six symptom clusters. Again, these symptoms clusters did not include the core symptoms of PTSD, 
namely intrusions, avoidance, hyperarousal. But it included the following ones, alterations in regulation of effect and impulses, alterations in attention of consciousness, alterations in self-perception, alterations in relationship with others, somatization and alterations in systems of meaning. As a side remark, um, for some reasons, this um, complex PTSD in the research literature, this previous one, had been called DESNOS, Disorders of Extreme Stress Not Otherwise Specified. Now, we have in ICD-11 two sibling disorders, as we call it. The first one, PTSD, or probably to, to call classic PTSD. I think this is a better term than to, to say um, simple PTSD. This was the condition already existent in the previous classification system. And it contains of three symptom clusters. Somewhat changed, altered to the previous formulations. And I'll read parts of it. Now the first symptom cluster is named re-experiencing in the present in form of vivid intrusive memories of flashbacks or nightmares which are typically accompanied by strong and overwhelming emotions. The second one, avoidance of thoughts and memories of the event or events or avoidance of activities or situations of people, reminiscence of the event. The third one, formerly labeled as hyper hypervigilance, uh, of, sorry, as labeled as hyperarousal, is now labeled perceptions of heightened current threat, as indicated by hypervigilance, or an enhanced startle reaction to stimuli such as unexpected noises. And the second sibling is now our complex PTSD, which has the three symptoms I just explained to you as the first part of the symptom pattern. In addition, it has persistent and pervasive impairments in three other areas in the area of effect regulation, of self-functioning, and relational functioning. Very important is that both conditions um, include an additional feature, namely significant psychosocial impairment in personal, family, occupational, or other areas. And if the functioning in the patient is maintained, this is then only by elevated and significant additional effort of the person. I'd like to go into a little bit more detail with the three additional symptom clusters. Actually, some of us, the experts who uh, described this disorder, call these three symptom clusters together disturbances in self-organization. But this is not an official term by now. The affect regulation symptom cluster means an elevated emotional relativity, violent outbursts, and dissociative symptoms when the person is under stress. The fifth general symptom cluster of PT, CPTSD, or the second one of um, the additional symptoms, is, is self-functioning, problems in self-functioning. It deals with persistent beliefs about oneself as dis diminished, defeated, or worthless, and pervasive feelings of shame and guilt features we know very well from these patients. And the last symptom cluster for complex PTSD 
are problems in relational functioning. Mainly this, uh, these are difficulties in sustaining relationships and in feeling close to others. I didn't tell so far about the trauma criterion for complex PTSD for a purpose. Um, the trauma criterion is relatively brief for the importance of the condition. I cite here, complex PTSD may develop following exposure to an event or a series of events of an extremely threatening or horrific nature. Commonly, after prolonged or repetitive events from which escape is difficult or impossible, such as torture, slavery, genocide campaigns, prolonged domestic violence, repeated ch childhood sexual or physical abuse. With the image I put here, I would like to stress that the trauma criterion is not the central one for diagnosing this condition. You wouldn't look extensively for the um, features of the lightning if a lightning gets into a tr tree. What happening with the tree is the most important. In the case, what happening with the mental apparatus, with the, with the psychological mindset of our patients is most important and not the very nature of the lightning or the trauma itself. Therefore, the general attitude of the ICD-11 committee is to regard the symptom clusters and assessing, diagnosing the symptoms as much more important for a diagnosis of complex PTSD than looking or uh, elaborating on the uh, traumatic event itself. I'd like to shortly um, mention differences uh, or differential diagnosis between personality disorder with borderline pattern, as it is called in ICD-11, and complex PTSD. In what we usually abbreviate as borderline disorder, um, there is often a fear of abandonment in our clients, which is not a feature of complex PTSD. A typical person with a borderline disorder has an unstable self-image or unstable sense of self. This is not the case for complex PTSD. Not, they are not as unstable, but they are have persistent negative self-images. And a feature of borderline disorder is frequent suicidality, which is to a much lesser degree um, the case for patients with complex PTSD. I think that future time will um, give us more hints and more clinical knowledge about the differences of the two diagnoses. Some first numbers, only a few, about the prevalence in populations. These two numbers come from representative population samples in different countries. The first one from Germany. These were period prevalences when uh, the researcher looks if this diagnosis is existent within one year. And in the general population, the complex PTSD diagnosis, diagnosis has a rate or prevalence of 0.5%, half percent in the population, compared to 1.5% of the classic PTSD diagnosis. Um, in Israel, um, the study did not um, research the period prevalence, but the lifetime prevalence, 
And this means if the diagnosis had been existent at any time in the life, and therefore by its very nature, the data of lifetime prevalences are higher than the period prevalences, as you can find here as well. In Israel, the prevalence of complex PTSD was 2.6, and in comparison, the PTSD, classic PTSD, prevalence 9.0. This comes to similar proportions of much fewer complex PTSD to some what higher numbers of classic PTSD and should be first indications of the communalities or of the, um, yeah, the presence in different countries and in different populations. At the end, I'd like to tell you about some very first treatment recommendations. We, as the experts, have to acknowledge that there is still limited empirical research because this disorder in its current, in its actual definition has not been researched um, as, as with other conditions because of it didn't exist. But if one or if a committee like um, a committee in the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies um, if they, if they um, create an overview, uh, a review about the existing literature, one could come to some um, conclusions and say it, the phase-oriented intervention is most probably the best way to treat patients with complex PTSD. And with phase orientation, I mean, for example, phases of treating safety first and then applying trauma-focused methods. And another conclusion from the very first overview would be that psychotherapy is a first-choice treatment for this kind of patients if there is no prominent comorbidity. But as far as we know from all the studies in the world and from all the clinical centers who did related research, it's psychotherapy of different techniques and methods that serves this kind of patients best. Thank you.